everyone, it's Maggie Bot, and welcome to my top 100 board games of all time. So, I will do my best to take you through my 100 top picks. Uh, I both use the Tom Vassell method of choosing, as well as a ranking software through PubMeeple to arrive at all of these things, and I will get back into that in uh, a future video. But for now, this is somewhat approved by me of how I feel about a lot of games. <laughs> We're going to do these t 10 at a time, and if you have any guests or feedback, please leave them in the comments below. Number 100, uh, we have Biblios. This is uh, designed by Steve Finn. This is along the lines of For Sale or High Society. It is a double bidding game. I don't know how else to describe it, but you go through the cards one time doing a thing and then you use the cards you went through the first time to do another thing. So on this one, you are really cleverly deciding which cards go into your personal stock, which ones go into a bidding stock, and which ones go into your opponent's hands. And as soon as all of those cards are dealt, you use the cards that went into your hand to bid on cards that actually count for points. Such a smart, clever, really well done game. Um, the only downside is when you take this out in front of players that have not played a lot of games, they are expecting you to roll these beautiful like 17 millimeter dice and the dice are just there to mark your points per color uh, you dominate. But really beautiful, cheap, lovely game. Number 99 is Hyperborea. Hyperborea came out a few years back right on the cusp of the bag building sensation. And the same year that Hyperborea came out, Orleans came out. And unfortunately, all, all signs point to Orleans being a better game. And it's true, Orleans is higher on this list but Hyperborea has its place. So you bag build to try and get colors to come out that once your actions are full, you can swipe all the cubes off of them to take the action, and then there's dudes on a map. It's so fun and cool and fresh, and it feels very different. Um, the gentleman that made this game made Signori, which is also higher on this list, which also feels very fresh and lovely. It's a different type of take on this kind of dice drafting thing. So you can see that they can build something unique out of something familiar. Hyperborea had a price point that was out of control, like $100. Had a bunch of minis, had a lot of problems, and it also had a slight balance issue where the blue cards included with it were much stronger than the other colors of cards. But I still love it, and I would highly recommend it, and I hope that at some point a second edition comes out. No, I have not tried the expansion. I hope to someday. Number 98 is Village. Village comes from Irish Spiel, which is Inca brand and Marcus brand designed. Village was worker placement, but not placement. You seeded the board with all these colored cubes, and each round you would place your workers and take one of the colored cubes, and that would kind of design what you could do for a turn. So it was sort of like Nippon mixed with a Kalos. And it was so fabulous, but everything you did in the game cost you time. And as time went by, you would have to retire your workers, which in this game meant that they would actually be buried. And if they had an occupation at the time, they would be buried in the annals of time and they would get to talk about their occupation. Otherwise, they'd have to go in kind of like an unknown soldier or graveyard. And the game pace was kept up by the number of dead workers. It was a really interesting game. I've only played one of the expansions and I didn't care for the dice version, but it was a very cool, unique take on worker placement in a year where nothing else was very cool or unique. Number 97 is Lorenzo in Magnifico. So I don't know that this warrants a space on my top 100 because I've only played this game maybe three times, but I thought it was interesting. Each round, new cards come out and players must try to purchase these cards and run their engine, but you can't place your worker on the same 
column as one of your own workers again and if it is in the same column as an opponent's worker you have to pay a whole lot more so it was just it was a great example of engine building in a tight space with a short play time. This is coming out to the States from Cool Mini or Not, but it originally was Cranio Creations and it has a unique art style and it was just different feeling and short compared to a lot of games in the same weight. Uh, number 96 is Viva Java the Coffee Game. Viva Java came from TC Patty the Third from Dice Hate Me Games uh, before they merged with uh, Greater Than Games. Viva Java was really cool. It was my first kind of semi-co-op experience before I played CO2. And in the game, you are pulling these beans out of a bag and each player is trying to make these blends of coffee to keep up on the hot blend board. And you have to do that by working with other players. Um, there were some colorblind issues. There were like six different shades of brown in this game. I didn't have much of a trouble, but a lot of people I played with had trouble. Um, it also says four to eight players, but it was really six to eight players. At four to six, you had to add in assistance to um, kind of enhance the game's effects, and the assistance didn't work very well. TC tried to kickstart a game called Club Zen um, maybe a year ago, which was supposed to be this game, but for one to four players, and I was really excited about it. I was all excited about it, but the Kickstarter didn't do well. Um, Dice Hate Me has kind of pushed into the greater than games world, so I don't know how popular this game is enough to warrant more development. They made a roll and write game called the Viva Java the Coffee Game, the Dice Game, that did pretty well at the store level, but that wasn't my jam. I really like the full game, and I really like a Euro that works from six to eight players anyway, because I don't have much of that. But um, I know that that limits the game's potential, so hopefully they will figure something out. Number 95 is Sail to India. Sail to India is from Hisashi Hayashi. It is three to four players and it a tiny little package from AEG. It was like a $16 game. Um, what's lovely about Sail to India, though it has a strong strategy that it's hard to get around, is that it was a lot of game in a $17 package. So it was a pick up and deliver with a cool resource management system. In the game, if you earn goods, money, victory points, anything, you had to have cubes available to mark those things or else you just lost them. So even if you got like 12 victory points, as long as you didn't have cubes there to mark those victory points, you would not get them. So it had like really cool resource management system and it was so small and cheap that I quite love it. And Hisashi Hayashi always has like a really unique way of taking on games. Though I did not love trains, you will see his work here later. Even in the same video, you will see his work. Uh, number 94 is Zendo. Um, when I was first starting out in games, um, the Looney Labs pyramids really spoke to me because they reminded me a lot of a deck of cards. So you could have a set of Looney pyramids and play 18 games rather than the components to you know, uh, Agricola and play the one game. So Looney Labs Pyramids really, really spoke to me on like a base level. And then playing something like Zendo just kind of formulated for me like how amazing those things could be. Zendo is a three to five player deduction game in which one player sets up a number of pyramids that follow a rule that they have in their mind, similar to Mao or Cow, if you've played those. Each player then needs to set up uh, their own set of pyramids to try and deduce what that rule could be. So the person in charge is going to be setting up um, things that follow the rule and things that don't, and marking the things that do or don't with these stones. And then the players, as they deduce things, will get the same stones, right or wrong, set next to their examples. And it's just so fabulous and simple and lovely. And deduction is a big part of what I really love about games. So Zendo is, has a big part 
of my heart, and I'm surprised it's only 94, but it's hard to get people to play with, so that might be what drives it down so low. Number 93 is Zulkin, the minor, mine calendar game. Um, Zulkin is a work placement game. It is two to four players. It's from Czech Games Edition, and Zulkin has a very unique timing system. So each round, you either add workers to the board or you remove them. As you add workers or are waiting subsequent rounds, each round, the middle gear of the board turns clockwise once. That causes all the other little gears to turn as well. So I know that setting my worker here, I need to wait three spaces until I can build the monument I want to build. And so the game is all about timing. It is multiplayer. There are other players kind of blocking what you want to do and doing their own thing. And some of the resources are limited, especially the crystal skulls, which are really, really important to the game. But overall, it is a very, like, you get in your own way kind of game. Like, you can really screw yourself over. And the base game just has about two strategies. There's a big corn strategy that leads to crystal skulls, or there is a crystal skull, crystal skull method that leads to more crystal skulls. Um, I have heard that the expansions help with the number of strategies, but I have not played them. It is a fabulous game, and it's really tight and wonderful. Number 92 is Yokohama. Yokohama came out in Taiwan um, last year in 2015 and will be out in the States any minute here. I have my copy at work from Kickstarter waiting for me. This is Sasashi Hayashi again, but in this one is a fully blown Euro. Um, all of the locations go down onto the table and there are little cards and players will be moving around the cards, kind of picking up and delivering resources building an engine and doing lots of cool things. I have only played this game twice, but I know that it is right up my alley. I had so much fun working toward the objectives and blocking people and finding cool, like special powers and that kind of stuff. It's totally for me. And I think for me, this is the heavier version of Istanbul, which really works for me. Istanbul was Rüdiger Dorn. It was a couple years ago and it did very well, but for me, it only felt like it had one path to victory, whereas Yokohama felt like it had several. And lastly tonight, our number 91 was A Feast for Odin. A Feast for Odin also came out in 2016. I'm hesitant to let newer games go too high on this list. Um, this is Uwe Rosenberg um, of Caverna Agricola Bonanza fame. Uh, Feast for Odin was one to four players, has a big board of possibilities. So each worker space can hold one to four workers. And generally speaking, the more workers that you have to place in a space, the stronger it is. And the game itself also has resources that level up. So they start as kind of this orange color. They can level into red, into green, into blue. And what you do with all of these resources is you build your little mat out. So you start with like negative 50 points and then everything you build over the course of the game gets rid of those negative points. And it's just a really cool way of looking at engine building as um, you start at a negative and you work toward a positive. The scores are not super high. I have seen negative points winning scores in this game, but I think um, overall it's just fascinating. There's so much going on. I really love Uwe Rosenberg for what he has contributed to the hobby. But none of his games have really caught me that well. Feast for Odin, Caverna, and a few others have definitely warranted lots of plays. But for me, you won't see a lot of his games on my top 100 list. I, I think that this is an anomaly that he finally caught something that I really love. The engine building aspect and the slight blocking aspect of this game are really fascinating. 
Um, it is giant and out of print and hard to find, and I apologize. And the theme means nothing. So, uh, use caution, play before you buy, but I still love A Feast for Odin. Uh, thanks for watching the first 10. We will be next, uh, with number 90 through 81. And I hope y'all are doing well. Thank you.